I would prefer to reframe the debate so we do real world theory and they do unreal <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and they do unreal theory rather, rather than ideal theory um, although I, I do think there is some room for ideal theory as we'll, as we'll see small room, small room for it um, but not only do I like the others think that injustice is prior to justice I also think probably more difficult uh, claim to establish that inequality is prior to equality as well or at least social inequality is prior to social equality which I'll try to elab elaborate as I go on um, but the question I want to try to deal with today is that if we believe in social equality and we're also real world theorists now how do we even make a start I mean, you know, what what do we do now now we can say we believe in social equality we say we believe in making changes from the world as it is well, what changes should we make? And how do we analyze the world so that we know what to do? And um, what I came to see, I was recently asked to do uh, some work for the Roundtree Foundation on a just a really a bit of secondary literature on philosophical approaches to poverty. And you know, this was quite an interesting thing because actually there's almost no philosophical work on poverty. There's one honourable exception recently, uh, Henny Lotter here in South Africa, in Johannesburg, has written a book on poverty. But if you think, who are the political philosophers in the analy analytic tradition of poverty? You're struggling. Um, you know, people talk about world poverty, so you know, people talk about $1 a day, $2 a day. They don't do much analysis of poverty, they just use a standard that's given to them by the World Bank, whatever. And um, you know, in, in one way that's surprising. I thought in my own work actually, so why have I not talked about poverty? And the, I think there's a respectable reason for this. Uh, Richard Hull in a book on deprivation put it very well I think, which is that we, we tend to think of low income as just one cause of disadvantage among others. So disability is another cause of disadvantage, uh, sexism, racism are forms of disadvantage. And so we really want, we focus on the functionings or the capabilities rather than the causes of the lack of, of them. And so income inequality, or, or poverty rather, uh, becomes only one possible cause. I think philosophically that is correct, but politically it's actually rather unhelpful in that as a phenomenon, poverty is probably one of the greatest causes of disadvantage in the world, um, in com some countries more than others. But I also got to thinking, by looking at this, I thought actually we can probably make some connections between social equality and poverty, and in particular relative poverty. And so that's what I'm going to try to uh, show you as I go on. Okay, so um, social equality, uh, you all know this, you heard it many times if you didn't know it before, but the, the contrast, or at least the contrast I uh, want to insist on is that people who believe in distributive equality agree with something that Jerry Cohen said, which is a task for an egalitarian is to, is to find that thing that we should all have equal shares of. So this is a question of the currency of egalitarian justice. What is that thing? Is it money? Is it primary goods? Is it even capabilities? But there has to, for a distributive egalitarian, there has to be a thing that we all should have equal shares of. Um, seeing that, I thought, that's not what I believe. That sort of sounds childish to me, that there should be something that should be shared out equally. And when I think about what attracts me to the idea of a society of equals, it's really about the way people relate to each other rather than what they have. And there's a type of you know, old-fashioned socialist European uh, egalitarianism, which is about the nature of the society you're living in rather than the possessions people have. And it actually st struck me that you know, the socialism I was brought up in um, really cast, you know, looked at material goods with a great deal of suspicion. So they thought, you know, if you were really focusing on objects of consumption, say, you'd just got the wrong idea of what a good life was. So in, in that socialist tradition, material possessions were considered to be maybe a pre prerequisite of a good life, but definitely not the good life. Suddenly I was being confronted with theories of equality that told us what we have to do is share out the material possessions equally. I thought, well, that's just got the wrong idea. So um, I was attracted, as George says, to this notion of relational equality. It's not new. 
Uh, you see it in theorists like Tawney, if you go back to the early part of the 20th century, if you go back to the 70s rather than the 80s and 90s, you can see it in David Miller and Richard Norman. <laughs> so there's always been a sort of countercurrent of social egalitarians, and, and they've always been ignored in the main journals until probably the 90s. That was, that was a change, I think. So suddenly philosophy and public affairs and ethics got interested in relational equality in the late 90s, having ignored it in the 70s and 80s. So I don't know why that was, maybe a change of editor or something. But uh, anyway, um, we, we, it, it came much more onto the scene at that point. Now, I, I worked on social equality in the 90s and for a few years afterwards. Um, and then I sort of hit a wall, really. Um, because as David Miller puts it, um, people who believe in social equality, we know what we're against. We're against hierarchy. We're against oppression. We're against exploitation. We're against domination. Uh, Tawney says we're against snobbery and civility. Uh, we're against deference. We're against caste systems. So we know what we're against. What are we for? Um, sorry, let's fly <laughs> around, around here. Um, that's going to look great on the video. Uh, um, so, so what are we for? And um, I couldn't answer this. I got a few PhD students to try to write their theses on it to tell me what we were for. And you know, they, they did a good job of saying what we might be for. But you know, when you look at, say, Tawney, He's a Christian socialist that somehow got to be do with universal love and you know, brotherhood and sisterhood of, of you know, men and women. Something. So I'm not going to sign up to anything with sort of Christian socialist uh, presuppositions. You know, if you go back generations, you've got people who give us other ideas, move forward, civic friendship. Well, what's that? Is that really a thick enough notion? Uh, you know, look people in the eye, okay, I agree with that, but is that my idea of a good society? So when it came to putting forward the positive notion of social equality, I was stuck. And then when you look at other people who've done that, they say, so Elizabeth Anderson, for example, has got a very clear account of the negative idea of equality. When she tells us what the, poverty, the, the positive idea is, it's really just to say it's a society where people can treat each other as equals. Well, we knew that, but that doesn't really advance us much from there. So um, thinking in positive terms, I thought, well, I just don't have a good model of social equality. But with the turn to um, real-world theory, I realized in other areas of philosophy, I hadn't considered the lack of a positive model of problem or other areas of policy. That is, you, know, you start from what you think is wrong, and you try to get rid of what you think is wrong, and when you've done that, the task is over. You can do other things. Right? So this is rather like the view that Sen crystallized in the idea of justice, a book that has been widely criticized. But in terms of the overall methodology, I think he's exactly right. What we need to do is to concentrate on manifest injustices. Now, manifest injustices are not things that necessarily we all know to be injustices to begin with. Quite often, there's a type of gestalt shift on something that we need philosophers to point out, not only philosophers, social scientists, for example, to point out something is an injustice. So in Sen's own work, he pointed out that famines are rarely caused by lack of food. That was a shock to all of us. And when we realize that the famines are caused by lack of entitlement to food rather than lack of food, you come to see the world a different way and you see something that looked like natural misfortune as an injustice. Uh, similarly, when he wrote that 100 million women are missing in the world, um, because of the way that girls are neglected relative to their brothers. And this was even before selective abortion, so who knows what the figures are now. Uh, you think, well, something's gone wrong in that world. Um, you don't, interestingly, we didn't know that before, because probably in a village there may be one or two girls dying. Um, those are individual tragedies, but when it's every village all over the world, suddenly it's not individual tragedies, but some systematic pattern that we see, and it needs someone like Sen to tell us. So I think we can identify things that become manifest injustices. Marital rape is something that's been mentioned uh, a few times in this conference. I think that's another example of something that no one knew, really even had words for. And this, of course, relates very strongly to Miranda's work about even having a language to describe injustices. So um, I think that a number of things come together here. Um, I, I would now say, I think, that 
to be someone who believes in social equality is to be opposed to a whole range of uh, asymmetric social relations and probably also atomistic social relations as well. So alienation, for example, would be something that uh, you should be opposed to if you believe in social equality. Um, so what do societies of social equality have in common? Well, I think what they have in common is they avoid these asymmetric and atomistic social relations. And I think there are lots of different ways now in which you could have a society of social equality. So um, I think the Quaker religion, for example, in which everyone calls, it treats each other in a very plain way, uh, is an excellent example of social equality. Uh, you, know, you couldn't force it from the point of view of social equality. It's not a society I want to live in particularly, um, but it's a fantastic society from the point of view of social equality. Some you know, 1960s San Franciscan hippie communities were also societies of social equality, very different to the Quaker societies, <laughs> uh, probably in every possible respect, um, other than, at least in theory, avoiding asymmetric and alienated social relations. So, in other words, I would say, would say that um, social equality can be multiply realized. There are many, or another way of putting it, there are many uh, sufficient conditions for social equality. There are some necessary conditions, but they're all negative about avoiding the uh, asymmetric and uh, atomistic social relations. So, um, there, there are lots of different ways of having society of social equality, and if we're making a choice between them, we're probably making them a choice on other grounds than whether they're achieving equality or not. So that's a picture I want to, uh, what, what Oxford philosophers say, commend to you. That's a picture I want to commend to you, uh, that you ought to agree with me, I hope, but I don't have any other arguments for it other than this is a picture that seems to me to be uh, an attractive one. Um, so, in a way, that was my first problem for social equality. What is it? And the answer is it's much easier to say what it isn't than what it is. Second problem, um, I opposed social equality to distributive equality. But um, you might want to say there has to be surely some relation between social equality and material equality. And I think there are two things to say here. Um, so, so one is that you know, I am convinced, I think, that if you have a society of absolutely gross material inequality, then it's going to be very hard indeed to achieve social equality. So I think as a prerequisite for social equality, some level of material, probably sufficiency rather than equality is needed. At the bottom end, I think it's much more controversial about the top end, that if you do, you know, is it impossible to have a society of social equality with some super rich people um, don't know, don't know the answer to that. Um, I'd much prefer to start at the bottom than at the top where we know what the problems are. Um, so in any case, uh, I, I do think there are probably material re prerequisites of social equality. But also, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to go as far as to say that you know, material comfort has no place in a conception of equality. I mean, that would be absurd, I think. So uh, what, what I would want to do is to present a type of hybrid view. And um, I'm taken actually by something I saw in a work called The Principles of Economic Planning, written in 1949 by Arthur Lewis. Now, Arthur Lewis uh, is from St. Lucia. He is, I'm told, the uh, first black man to have won a Nobel Prize for anything other than peace. He was a development economist. Um, I, was, I meant to look it up this morning. I didn't get around to doing it. I don't know if any black men have ever won the Nobel Prize for anything but peace or literature or Arthur Lewis. I don't know, Charles, whether you know of any other. You don't think so. So he's probably the only uh, black Nobel Prize winner for anything other than literature or peace, I should think. And, and, um, so anyway, he was writing in the 1940s. And he was just describing his view of what the socialist wants. And I'm not sure he was endorsing this himself, but I thought he, he, he put it very nicely. So what he said is that uh, as a minimum standard, what the socialist wants is a society in which every child shall grow up in pleasant homes and attractive surroundings and with good educational opportunities, 
in which every adult should be provided for in sickness and adversity, and in which the pensioner can take untroubled ease. I thought, well, that sounds nice. I like the, I like the sound of that. That doesn't sound like too much to ask to me. You know, that, that sounds like a sort of modest aspiration that sound, sounds like um, something we could all aim for. You know, the child is included. The child needs a pleasant home, attractive surroundings, good education. The adults should be provided for in sickness and adversity. I mean, that obviously could cover a whole range of things. And in which the pensioner can take untroubled ease. I, what I particularly like about this, actually, is, is the focus on the whole life. And that you know, much political philosophy just seems to focus on the working life. Whereas I think the greatest inequalities we probably see in terms of living standards and health are in the retired population or the population that would like to be retired but can't be because they're still having to work. So I think you, know, you really see inequalities, say, in the over 60s, much more than in the working population where you know, you know, academics like me will have a decent pension, probably... Uh, much less expenses because we'll have paid off our, our mortgage, kids will be off our hands, so we'll probably have the highest living standard we've ever had. Whereas those who are in rented accommodation, who don't have a decent pension, who still have you know, dependent grandchildren possibly around with them, are going to have a miserable time and probably in poor health, which they've ruined through terrible working conditions. So I would encourage political philosophers to look at inequality among the elderly, which is a topic I don't think we've even begun to look at, actually, although I think some sociologists uh, are doing that now, of course. All right, so um, the view I want to put forward then is a society of social equality is one that meets what I will call the, the Lewis standard, where we, you know, we have this rather comfortable but not extravagant l level of uh, material survival. Note that Lewis, everything Lewis says is about material consumption. There's nothing there about the way you relate to other people in his account of what the socialist wants, which makes it an, an, an inadequate view of socialism, I think. But it does give you the materi a material level uh, that the socialists could rely on. Okay, but now we hit the really hard problem, which is in every society in the world we haven't, we haven't met the Lewis standard. That there's no society that gives uh, every one of its citizens what Lewis thinks the socialists once and also, of course, uh, most societies in the world, probably all of them, have not overcome the social inequalities, exploitation, oppression, domination, snobbery, civility. Um, and it does seem to me now that um, our aspirations for what can be achieved, particularly in relation to hierarchy, uh, um, it, maybe people on the left, including myself, have been over-optimistic about what is possible for human beings to achieve in terms of overcoming hierarchy. Um, you know, two bits of literature, very different. One from Freud. Uh, Freud, commenting on the Russian Revolution, said, well, you know, the Soviets thought they could, they could overcome hierarchy by abolishing classes, abolishing economic classes, because they'd seen economic domination and thought that hierarchy went with economic uh, oppression. Well, I've got bad news for you. If you equalize economic uh, incomes, then the hierarchy will just reassert itself in some other form, perhaps through, the, through party membership, he said. Uh, this is in the 1920s, in civilization that's discontent. So it wasn't really a prediction because he was seeing what was already going on. Um, no, Michael Marmot, very different uh, area of thought, works on the social determinants of health. Um, and he is one of the people who has pointed out to us that every society has a social gradient in health. That is, um, the poorer you are, the, on average, the lower your life expectancy and the worse your health. Uh, and this is true for all societies in the world at the mo in, in the modern age. Um, he, he came to this view by looking at the uh, British civil service um, he'd been called in to investigate the claimed phenomenon of executive stress, which we all knew about in the 1970s and 80s. This is a hypothesis that if you're at the top of a hierarchy, your job is so stressful it's going to be bad for your health. And the civil service, no doubt the top civil servants, called him in to demonstrate this. And what they found was the exact opposite, um, which is you know, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the better your health, to the point where permanent secretaries on average live longer than their deputies, 
and they live longer than their assistants and this goes all the way down to the post room and the people having the most heart attacks are the people at the very bottom um, whereas it's only when someone at the top has a heart attack that anyone notices and, and that's why you, know, you get the, sort of the myth of executive stress there is no such thing as executive stress as being bad for health uh, he made the distinction between acute stress which the executive has but that's over so you have a stressful events and then you relax but what is really problematic for your health is to be under chronic stress which never goes away and the lower you are down the hierarchy the more chronic stress you have to the point where people who are unemployed have much more chronic stress than people who are employed because they don't know how to pay they, they don't know how to pay the next bill they don't know where their kids are what's happened to them they're in trouble with the criminal justice system and so on so if you suffer from chronic stress, then this is going to be um, a real problem for your health, on average. And you know, Marmot uh, you know, illustrates this with the idea of taking a ride on the suburban railway from the center of Washington, D.C. to the suburbs of, I think it must be called something like Cherry Hill or something. Like that. Um, and there are 20 stops on the, on, the, on the railway, and for every stop, life expectancy increases by one year because you've got the deprived living in the inner city and the very wealthy living out in the suburbs. And, and he, he can do a similar thing in London, but he's got to choose his route very carefully because London, <laughs> uh, London is not quite the same in the, in the way that it segregates the rich and poor as uh, American cities do. So, um, so he's very keen to remove hierarchy because he thinks hierarchy contributes to health inequality. But he's not optimistic that we can do this. Um, and you know, he, he really wants to do it, if, in, as far as anyone can do. But he points out that, um, and other people have done this work, in primate studies, primates just develop their own hierarchies. And to the point where you, you can have, take five hierarchies, you've got the five leaders, and each of these hierarchies, put them together, those leaders will establish a new hierarchy of those five. Um, and his view is, you know, we are primates, we have a genetic inheritance, we will be inevitably falling into hierarchies. What we have to do is accept that and mitigate it rather than ignore it. Uh, but you can see, I mean, from Anne's talk about the way universities are sorting themselves out into hierarchies, uh, socialist groups sort themselves out into hierarchies, you know, both internally and externally, and we, don't, we just don't have good examples of non-hierarchical human relations sustained over a period, I think. So I'm, I, I think we need to mitigate hierarchies as much as we can. I don't like them. You know, we'd like to get rid of them as much as we can, but I don't think we can wish them away, unfortunately. And I don't think it's because we've been brought up under capitalism, because primates haven't, on the whole. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, what do we do? Well, there are some things we can do. So hierarchy is inevitable, but exploitation isn't. Domination, oppression... There are many of these uh, asymmetric social relations we might well be able to address. And, and you know, societies have dealt with hierarchical relations in different ways. But um, how do we deal with the material deprivation that we see in many places? What are we going to do about trying to bring more people up to the, what I call the Lewis standard? And here I want to look at work on, on poverty. Um, so much discussion of poverty starts with work by Roundtree from 1901. And he has a very simple, perhaps oversimple definition of poverty, which is poverty is essentially not having access to a level of resources that are sufficient for you to, make, to maintain your health. So if you don't have access to resources that will keep you healthy, then you suffer from poverty on Roundtree's view. And Roundtree did a very detailed study of the York of his day, and he tried to work out exactly how much to the shilling and pence you needed uh, in order to get that standard and you know, what your shopping basket had to contain and so on in order to buy the goods and paying your rent and the amount of fuel you needed to maintain your, your health. Now, Roundtree made a distinction that I haven't seen used very much in the literature on poverty since, which is a distinction between what he calls primary poverty and secondary poverty. Now, primary poverty is, as just described, not having access to resources that allows physical health. Secondary poverty, which is really interesting, I think, 
is having access to that level of resources, but spending them on other things. That is, you've got enough money, you've got the 14 shillings and 11 pence or whatever it was in York at that time that would have allowed you to buy the right basket of commodities, but you weren't. You were spending some of your money on other things. And um, Roundtree was a Quaker. Uh, he was particularly interested in people spending money on the demon drink here. So instead of buying healthy goods for their kids, they were, they were going to the pub. They were also gambling as well. And so it's interesting that in York in 1901, people who could have spent their money on healthy food were not always doing that. They, were, they would rather go to the pub than have an adequate diet. They'd rather, go to the, they'd rather gamble than heat their homes in some cases. And this he found um, obviously very troubling. Um, I think also we need to add, in a way, the converse to secondary poverty. So there's a little puzzle, I think, about um, people who do manage to achieve a level of consumption, but only through very irregular and informal ways of getting resources. So take someone who, who's a beggar, and they manage to beg enough to get decent food, say. Suppose they do that. Or someone who manages to get to that level by theft, or as often happens, for example, in the uh, refugee camps after civil wars, you know, orphan teenage girls managing to get what they need through transactional sex. So these are people who do have access to the level of resources, but through illegal or demeaning or dangerous ways of achieving that. Are they poor or not? Now, by Roundtree's definition, they're not poor because they have access to that level of poverty, uh, of resources. But it seems to me we want to say they are poor, even though they're achieving a certain level of consumption. So I think, I, I don't have a good term for it, but for the moment, uh, suspen suspended poverty would do, I think. But if anyone's got a better term, then, and you want a footnote in a paper, come and see me afterwards. Uh, so anyway, this idea that you can achieve a certain level of consumption, but only through illegal or demeaning or dangerous, or very dangerous means. And interestingly, I think, suspended and secondary poverty will also often go together. The people who are engaging in criminal activity, uh, you know, transactional sex, in order to get enough to live on, may actually want to have high quality leisure rather than food, having done that. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so these are concepts from Roundtree and an extension of his account. Now, in the 1970s, particularly in the late 1970s, the notion of relative poverty became very much more influential, particularly in the UK, because it was thought that in the UK almost no one lives in absolute poverty. Or, you know, almost no one is in a position where they can't get a decent diet. But we didn't want to say poverty has disappeared. So what do we mean then by poverty if we've achieved the absolute standard? And there's a very famous definition from Peter Townsend in a book from 1979. This is very widely quoted. Uh, I'll just read it out. Individuals, families, and groups in the population can be said to be in poverty when they lack the resources to obtain the types of diets, participate in the activities, and having the living conditions and amenities which are customary or at least widely encouraged or approved in the societies in which they belong. Uh, their resources are so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that they are, in effect, excluded from ordinary living patterns customs and activities. Okay, so these are people who can feed themselves, they can heat their homes, they can clothe their kids, but they can't take part in the activities that are customary or at least widely encouraged or approved in their societies, and so they're in effect excluded from ordinary living patterns, customs and activities. So when I read this, I thought, well, this is very interesting from those of us who believe in social equality because we've got poverty here now defined in terms of inclusion or lack of inclusion. So relative poverty and social inequality have at least one overlap here. They're not the same thing because this is only about inclusion and exclusion. So that's only one aspect of social inequality. But I thought, well, maybe we can get some mileage out of, out of the literature on relative poverty in thinking about social equality. 
But of course, it's a thought that had been had for a long time. Um, March of Sen quotes Adam Smith several times. Um, Smith points out that in the, the Britain of his day, there were things that you needed in order to be seen in public without shame. As Smith gives two examples that I know of, one is leather shoes and the other is a linen shirt. Um, so these are things that anyone needs if they're going to appear in public without shame. You don't need them to keep warm because there are other types of clothing you could wear, but these are customary or expected in your society, and if you don't have them, then you will feel ashamed of yourself. You will not want to be seen in public, or you'll be ashamed to be seen in public. And you know, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the testing ground of viciousness and inequality is a school playground, and you know, for kids who don't have the right clothes, even if they can function just as well as anyone else in the clothes they're wearing, they will feel ashamed of themselves, and they will feel that they are poor, even if they're meeting every physical standard of efficiency. Okay, so this is um, a point that Sen makes a lot of, and you know, he makes quite an insightful point that, um, the, in a way, the distinction between relative and absolute poverty collapses here, because he says you know, relative poverty in the space of commodities can turn into absolute poverty in the space of capabilities. That is, if you don't have what other people around you have, then your capabilities may well be uh, absolutely affected from this. But um, the, so that's one argument to try to collapse the distinction between absolute and relative poverty. Um, Henny Losser uh, has also tried to argue against it um, because he points out that if we really have an absolute notion of poverty, we, we do want some notion of social relation even in absolute poverty that human beings are social creatures, and that um, if you don't have any type of social connection with other people, even if you're achieving a level of health, then there's a sense in which you're absolutely poor, and that there must be a relative standard, both in relations to each other and relations to your society. Um, so, uh, Lotta just says, let's get rid of the distinction between absolute and relative poverty, and let's have a distinction between extreme and intermediate poverty. They both have a social element. Now, some poverty is really bad. Some poverty is not so bad, but it's still bad. Right? Um, but you know, there, you know, it's going to be very hard, actually, to think, are we get, you know, what's the cutoff line between extreme poverty and, absolute, uh, and intermediate poverty? Isn't it really a scalar notion rather than a distinction? Uh, so you know, there's work to be done thinking about that. There's also another problem, though, with relative poverty, or at least how it's instrumentalized, which is that typically, so the idea of re relative poverty is not having enough to participate. But typically, when people put measures of relative poverty, they're measures like not having uh, as much as 60% of mean income. So uh, the, the idea, is, for example, Brian Barry says, if you have less than half of mean income, then you can't do the things that other people expect to be able to do. So relative poverty is then instrumentalized in terms of a place in the income distribution. That if you're below a certain level in the income distribution, you're in relative poverty. Now critics have said, well, that just turns poverty into inequality. And what happens is as society gets richer, you can actually have more people falling into poverty, even if they're all getting better off in material terms, which doesn't sound too good. Um, but Lotta makes a converse point, which she says, well, in a really poor society, it may be that most people can't do what's expected of people. Um, and so defining things in terms of a percentage of where you are in an income distribution won't capture the idea that you can have societies where most people suffer from what we would think of as relative poverty. They can't do what is, remember, it's not just customary, but expected <coughs> in your society. So you could be in a society which is so poor, most people can't do what's normally expected of people in that society. So um, that, is, that is a problem. Um, there is another problem, and this was pointed out by sociologists very soon after Peter Townsend uh, gave his definition. Um, he, Townsend's definition to repeat is to say that um, you can't participating in the activities and having living conditions and amenities which are customary or widely acknowledged or approved in the society in which you belong. Well, what society do you belong to? 
That is, now this is defined, look, relative poverty is defined with reference to your society, but what is your society? Um, that at the very least, most people can be thought of as being part of a mainstream society and some type of subgroup as well. And it may be your members of many subgroups. Um, you know, students in this university may be the poorest student in the university, but the richest person in their uh, neighbourhood or in their family because they've got a grant. Uh, so you know, I was you know, hearing a story here uh, the other day of students sending part of their grants home to their families as a type of remittance, which uh, you know, w I, I'm sure it happens, but it's new to me as a social phenomenon. <coughs> So you can see someone who moves in two circles, and I think this is often true for uh, you know, recently arrived immigrants in the United States who are taking very low paid and status jobs in the US, but sending home what seems to be quite a lot of money back home, even though it's a small proportion of what they're earning. And they, they're sort of the big person back home, but at the bottom of the heap in the US. So uh, you know, what is your society? So just for simplicity, uh, what I want to do is pretend that people have two societies. One is mainstream society and the other is their subgroup. But I know this is a ridiculous oversimplification. But that uh, is what I want to do for the purposes of the rest of this paper. Okay, so when we're thinking about poverty, I think we, we need to think not, about, not only about levels of income, but we also want to look at patterns of expenditure as well. And so, uh, I apologise for not having a handout or slide at this point, um, but I want to make a distinction between different types of expenditure. So the first type of expenditure would be on, the, on just the absolute necessities you need to keep alive. So you need, there are, you need a certain level of food, you may need a certain level of shelter just to keep alive. And that is, you might think, the lowest level of absolute poverty. If you fall below that, you will soon die. Okay, so um, you know, what would that be? Maybe the dollar a day standard. Actually, it's below the dollar a day standard, but it's, you know, it's very, very low. Okay, so the absolute necessities you need to keep alive. Then there's at the next level, which is the one that Roundtree was interested in, uh, basic necessities to achieve normal chances of health. So you know, that goes beyond the absolute necessity. It requires a balanced diet. It requires you know, you know, uh, you know, reasonably adequate clothes and shelter. So, so that was the round tree level, level, the basic necessity. So we've got the first one was absolute necessities. The second is basic necessities. Third one is normal leisure goods. And this wasn't included in round tree's definition. So the idea of now we would say having a TV, a phone, nights out, every now and again, uh, you know, what would make you feel much more like a human being than just simply consuming in order to maintain your health and your ability to work? So normal leisure goods. A fourth category I'm calling inclusion goods for your sub-society. Now this is going to vary tremendously from your social group. But there are going to be things you need to buy. So uh, remember the Adam Smith phrase, uh, what's necessary to be seen in public without shame, well, that is going to depend on what goes around in your group. So if your, um, from, if your subgroup is a very aesthetic religious group, for example, it might be very important to have very plain clothes. If you're in a different type of society, you might need a different type of uh, clothes altogether and, and other goods as well. Uh, the next one, fifth category, and I'm leaving this, this fairly closed for the moment. Uh, I'll come back to it. Inclusion goods for mainstream society. So this is really what Townsend was interested in. If you don't have access to the goods that will include you in mainstream society, you're poor, you're relatively poor. But also, um, you know, most people do mention the importance of savings as well, and savings will be for having goods in reserve and for investment in your children, in your future as well. And then finally, the seventh category is luxury goods, which go beyond the normal leisure goods. So the seven categories, absolute necessities, basic necessities, normal leisure goods, inclusion goods for sub-society, inclusion goods for mainstream society, saving for reserve and investment, and luxury goods. Now, all of these, with the exception of luxury goods, would be needed to achieve 
inclusion in mainstream society and I think the Lewis standard of comfort that you'd need, you'd need um, normal leisure goods, basic necessities, savings and so on to be able to achieve that. That's not enough for social equality. Social equality also needs uh, factors about working conditions, the law, a whole other host of structural conditions that other people have mentioned. All right, so how are people going to behave? How, you know, if people have got income, how are they going to spend their money? Now, they must spend their money on absolute necessities, first of all. That seems to be a given. If you don't have enough food to live, you will die. So that's the end of that. So you have to spend your first amount of money on the absolute necessities. What comes next? Well, naively, we might assume that basic necessities for health will be next. But Roundtree's concept of secondary poverty shows that's not so. Uh, many people will spend their money on other things. And you know, Roundtree was worried about people going to the pub. Uh, why do people go to the pub? Well, one is to get drunk, of course. Um, but Roundtree, um, you know, it's very sweet. He, he tries to be a very good scientist. So he sends his enumerators out through uh, York, and he does it himself. And there's one passage where he's obviously st st it's a cold, dark winter's night. And his job is to watch people going into the pub, seeing how long they spend in there, what they do when they're in there, and, how, and then come out again. And he talks about the type of people that go in. And you can see he's sort of having, beginning with a type of very disapproving attitude, he sort of, after a while, he sort of gets it. And you know, he, he sees that people are going there and they're having a good time and they're singing and they're enjoying themselves. And he's got a little note to himself that in the temperance movement, we've missed a trick here. The, the, what we've got in the temperance movement is lost unless it can give you something like alcohol-free pubs for people to go and enjoy themselves. So yeah, the, the pub is not just where pe people go to engage in dissolute behavior, um, but where they go to connect with other people. So it's part of you know, local social inclusion to go to the pub, particularly when your houses as, were as horrible as a lot of pe these people were living in. So this was one place, actually, they could get warm and speak to people and have a good time, forget the rest of the time. OK, so I would say you know, going to the pub includes sub-society inclusion plus normal leisure goods. And you know, to overcome my own naivety, um, a few years ago I was in Namibia and I was taken to uh, Katatura there, which is a former homeland. And it was originally built in the apartheid years. It was built 10, about 10 miles out of the capital so that it was impossible for people to walk to the capital and walk back again easily. Um, and there's no public transport there. So it was a, type of, it was a way of parking uh, black Namibians unless they were needed. And then a taxi would be sent for the workers that were needed in the capital. So, um, and in the apartheid times there, um, it was very segregated into subgroups. You know, reasonably decent housing, though very cramped. But of course, over time, it has expanded to the point where there are, when I visited it, there were many very informal shacks, uh, Angolan refugees living in um, dwellings that were just four zinc sheets. I'm sure you have exactly the same thing here as well. Um, but what struck me as I was being driven through this was the, the shops there. And so there were food supermarkets, one or two big food supermarkets. But as you went up, even when you went, got beyond the area where there was water or power, there were three types of, I have to put it, retail opportunity that came up over and over again. One was bars, which fits in with the Roundtree analysis of York. Uh, the second was mobile phone shops. And the third was sort of grooming opportunities of various sorts, so nail bars, hair salons, barbershops for men. And you know, this reminded me of the bit of London I was living in at the time, which was a poor part of London. Uh, like many academics, we find nice, nice houses and poor bits of town. And you know, on a Friday night, you know, the nail bars were doing a roaring trade. And the same is true in parts of the US as well. So what's going on here? Well, it, I, I came away thinking that actually for most people, um, what the, this shows is that connecting with others and looking good has a higher priority than maintaining your physical health, uh, at least in the short term. That instead of spending money on food, people spend it on grooming, on mobile phones so they can call their friends, going to the bars so they can meet their friends. So those notions of social connection 
seem to be, for many people, a higher, certainly a higher preference, whether we call it a higher need, I think is, would be an interesting question. And um, I, I was amazed, I'm, I'm teaching here some uh, writings of Marx, early writings of Marx, and so I'm rereading uh, texts that in some cases I haven't paid a lot of attention to in the, every year. Um, so I'm looking at the alienated labor manuscripts, and I was amazed to see Marx talk, when Marx talks about the alienated worker, uh, the alienated worker who can't express their human essence in their work, uh, he says they, they take pleasure in their animal functions, eating, drinking, procreating, it's a euphemism, um, and he and, and says, and in their own home and in dressing up. So this is you know, really interesting. 1844, Marx is saying that people are taking, you know, people are performing dressing up because they can't express themselves in their real life. It's a type of how you express your human essence in an alien, under alienated circumstances. But of course, you know, 1844, Marx in these texts had been reading Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, where Adam Smith makes the same points about linen shirts and leather shoes. And we go back and back and back. So how people are seen in public seems to be an incredibly important uh, matter to them, and certainly you know, in the writings we have from the 18th century, but no doubt it goes much, much before that. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, well, people are spending a lot of money on local inclusion, or they're spending a lot of their budget on local inclusion. Um, why are they doing this, and is it a problem? Well, first let me answer the question is whether it's a problem. There, there are two ways in which forms of local inclusion are problematic. One is a direct way. So there are things you can do to yourself to be included locally, which will then create problems for you if you want to join the mainstream society. So in, in many societies, having a tattoo, for example, a tattoo on your face, that could be what gives you street credibility where you live. It's not going to be so good when you go for a job interview. Okay. Um, when I was talking to George about this, he pointed out a story. I don't know how general it is. If it was a British news story, there, there would be been very small numbers of people rather than a general phenomena. But in the Cape Town flats of uh, people having their front teeth removed to give them a gangster look. And so they, they have the top two uh, here and here removed. Um, so that is a pretty direct way of making you not fit into mainstream society. Although there's a twist which we'll come back to. Um, so there are direct ways of spending your money that could make it difficult for you to fit in mainstream society. There are also indirect ways, of course. So if you're spending it on status good clo you know, clothes, expensive, flashy watches, the latest phone, you're not spending it on uh, education for your kids, quite likely. You're not spending it on developing yourself. So it has an, you know, spending on status goods has an opportunity cost in terms of not investing in yourself and investing in your family or investing or saving for a better house. Um, now, these people, if they're spending on expensive status goods, on dentistry, rather than basic goods or saving for better housing, then they'd be in secondary poverty by Roundtree's definition. What would happen if we redistributed income? to people who are spending money on status goods. So you know, many political philosophers think we can solve global poverty by redistribution of income. What would happen if we redistribute income? Well, um, you know, here's an example from the US. Susan Mayer uh, wrote a book called What Money Can't Buy. And she was looking at the ways of improving educational achievements at, in low income, low economic status uh, households in the US. And people had correctly pointed out there's a correlation between family income and educational achievement. So what happens if you give the parents more income? You know, do the kid, does the kid's school achievement go up? Well, yes, if the family is really poor. So if they're sending the kids to school ill-nourished, if the kids are too hungry to learn, then giving the families some more money, they could feed the kids properly, then the kids can learn better. So at very low levels, higher income does help school achievement. But at higher levels, she says the advantage is minimal because what people spend the money on will not be the things that improve their kids' prospects. So they, they'll buy a better car, it's a good reason for doing that, buy better furnishings, fantastic, 
but that's not going to help your kids in school. And you know, she points out that the relation between income and school achievement for kids, family income and school achievement for kids, is much more complicated. That children of graduate students, well, graduate students are not very wealthy in the US, so they count as poor by income measures, but their kids do fine at school. So you know, it doesn't seem to be that there's any obvious direct relation between income and achievement. It's rather the things that go along with low income rather than the low income itself. All right, so um, the question then is whether it's rational to spend money on status goods or not for people in this position. Um, and I think that we, we now have to look at structural issues in order to understand this a bit better. Um, the problem in some societies, and I think this, is, this society is, is a clear example, is um, the type of opportunities uh, poor people have to improve their situation. So um, you can imagine a society, and I think this is a society, imagine opportunity as if it rungs on a ladder. Now, you can have a society where the rungs on the ladder have relatively evenly spaced. So if you have aspirations to improve yourself, you can do that quite easily. You can move up to the next rung. You know, it takes work, it takes sacrifice, but you can do that. So you have to invest to do it. But there are other types of societies where you've got some rungs clustered at the bottom, some rungs clustered at the top. And it's very, very difficult to move from the bottom cluster to the top cluster. Um, so in South Africa, it can be done. There are entrepreneurs who do it, sports stars do it. Uh, music stars do it, fashion models do it, but these are tiny numbers of people um, as a proportion of the population as a whole. So if um, the opportunities you have facing you are really to spend your money on making you feel better about yourself, to fit in better with your society, or what, then why not spend it on status goods? Whereas if you've got a situation where there are some you know, reasonable aspirations at the next level, then you have a real choice there. You have a choice about whether you're going to spend money fitting in with the group you're in or whether you're going to do better to try to achieve the Lewis conditions for your family. So you might think, I'll, I'll save money and spend it on house improvements, but if I spend it on house improvements and things get stolen, well, why would I do that? So there's a lot of research on a type of instant consumption that uh, there's an interesting book called Portfolios of the Poor and how people live on $2 a day. And one conclusion in this is that it's actually not too difficult to live two, on $2 a day if you got $2 every day. But the problem for a lot of people on $2 a day is that they get the money in a very lumpy way. So they might not get anything for a month and then they get a lot of money. If they've got a lot of money, then everyone around them will want it. So what you have to do is spend it quickly. So at least you're spending it on yourself so that other people don't get it. So you, you spend it on parties or you treat your friends. Uh, and so it's that irregular structure. And of course, everyone knows you've got the money because you've been working for a couple of days, so you can't, even, you can't pretend you haven't. So you have to spend it quickly if you're going to consume it at all yourself. Now, it, it may seem, you know, what I'm saying is very conservative. In a way, it is. I'm, I'm suggesting that we need to make, think about social mobility and structures of social mobility. Is it patronizing to think that uh, you know, poor people will want to join the mainstream. Well, you know, here's a, another bit of um, work, that, survey work that was done in a book called Poor Economics by Esther Dufflo and, and Banerjee. And there she's looking at microcredit. And a lot of people think microcredit, I, I think this is a less fashionable view now, but lots of people thought access to microcredit would be a way in which poor people would be able to improve their lives. And there was a view that you know, poor people are natural traders and all they need is a bit of capital and off they can go and trade and the world would be fantastic. And it is true that there are some people who are natural traders and if they're given some capital, they can trade. Some people are very astute. Um, but Esther Duffler says, if you ask those people what they want for their children, do they want their children to be business people, entrepreneurs, traders with big capital? The overwhelming view is what people want for their children is a safe government job with a pension. And you know, this is, you know, so when I was growing up, you know, this is what people wanted for their kids in England. The, the government jobs aren't so safe anymore now. Uh, and I think they want their kids to be bankers because even if you get the sack, you've had so much money in a short time, that's fine. 
Um, but you know, th this idea is you know, what you want is for your children not to have to struggle like you've struggled. And um, I, th now, I think we see this all, all through. In fact, in 1985, when a study was done, second Carnegie report, the only way in which black people on average could get a decent living standard in apartheid South Africa was by working for the government in one form or another, whether it was central government or local government. This was the only way people were getting above the, what was called the supplementary living standard on, on average. Okay, so um, the, the thought I have is that we, we're stuck at the moment in societies where consumption will be channeled into those things that make you fit in better with your subgroup and that could be fantastic. You, know, you might think this is multiculturalism on a big scale or something. Um, but I, I think it's often the case, not always, often the case people are doing that because they've got not, they don't have any alternatives. They don't have any real alternatives. And so although this doesn't sound like a society of social equality, in order to get closer to social equality, we do need to do things to improve social mobility. And this has got to be structural. In South Africa, um, the, there are barriers to social mobility. Um, you know, the elite now doesn't want their position to be undermined. Um, I, I said that for uh, black people under apartheid, the good jobs are in government. That remains true now for many people who are in the, in the uh, elite. And you know, public choice economics tells us that if you've got a job, your first incentive is to make sure you still have that same job next year or a better one. So every bureaucrat's first, uh, first incentive will be to make sure they remain in the job. Similarly for academics, of course. Now, you know, what we want to, if we've got a job now, we might think what we, our, our main job is research and teaching. No, it isn't. Our main job is making sure we've still got a job next year and doing whatever is needed in order to make that possible. So those people in power are, are reluctant to give it up, uh, why would you, uh, unless you're extremely self-sacrificing? But there are types of barriers to social mobility. Um, there are people telling me it's very hard to start a new business here. Uh, it's very difficult to get the papers sorted out. So there's a lot of informal business going on rather than people joining the formal business sector. Uh, it pains me as an egalitarian to say this, but what we need, it seems to be what we need to do in the first step is to free up the market here that uh, at the bottom end of the market rather than the top end of the market where the problems have been. Um, but the battle for social equality, I think, is now a structural one here. Uh, you know, this is not news to anyone in this room. Um, in other countries, it will be different. In the UK, I'm not sure that its structures so much that are causing problems. Perhaps uh, education has been a big problem for us. In the US, I'm sure the issues are different again. Um, different societies will face different problems. But I think once we, we realize the power of the notion of, so, of social inclusion in a local group and how local social inclusion can be destructive towards mainstream social inclusion, you know, we really do have a struggle on our hands here. And this is another reason why, to go back to Jeremy Cronin's talk, it, the redistribution of resources will not be uh, the solution unless there are structures in which people can use those resources more effectively. And so you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about income, we've spent a lot of time thinking about distribution, we haven't spent so much time thinking about what people are going to do with that money once they get it and whether they can use it to benefit themselves and their families in the longer term. Okay. <laughs>